I want to welcome everybody to today's program. We're so excited to be here with the winner of the 2023 Ilya Salida Excellence in Research Award winner. Um, we're so excited to hear more about the project. Um, I want to start today by introducing Marina Yubarovsky of the Genesis Philanthropy Group. She's going to introduce um, the project and welcome everybody officially today. Hello, it's a pleasure to see everyone. I've learned to unmute myself before talking, which is, uh, I think, an achievement uh, for me at least. So just um, just a month ago, time flies so quickly, we were at the JFN conference in Arizona and um, we honored Dr. Levitas and the CASG team uh, who are here as well for their groundbreaking study career trajectories of Jewish educators in the United States. And I know it's groundbreaking, not because I think so, because that's probably not worth a lot, but because some folks who are really, really excellent in the field of applied studies have said so, and that's worth a lot. The landmark research not only contributes to the success of Jewish programming, but I think also highlights the importance of applied research in the Jewish nonprofit sector in general. And that's really the whole idea of the Ilya Salida Excellence in Research Award. It was named uh, in honor of Ilya Salida of Blessed Memory, and it recognizes research projects that embody Ilya's passion for informed, data-driven philanthropy. Ilya's relentless pursuit of excellence and perfection, sometimes to a fault, <laughs> um, was the driving force behind this award. And it really aims to uplift the entire sector by highlighting the importance and leveraging uh, the results of rigorous and innovative research. You know, I was recently reading a speech that Ilya had uh, given almost a decade ago to a group of undergraduate students in a program that we were funding. Um, and though it was a long time ago, and this award was nowhere on the horizon at that moment, I can't think of a better way to encapsulate why it's so important. And so, um, in Ilya's own words, they say that uh, in theory, there's no difference between theory and practice, but in practice, there is. That's why applied research is so crucial. It bridges the gap between what we think we know and what actually works in the real world. So um, I couldn't have said it better myself. Uh, thank you, Ilya. He's still watching out for me and my speeches. And so we gather today to learn more about this landmark study um, and we honor his legacy and his unwavering dedication to this sector. And we recognize the critical role that applied research plays in addressing the challenges and the opportunities that are facing our communities, of which I know each of you knows there are plenty. And also, um, no less important, we celebrate the inspiring work of those who, like Ilya, have committed themselves to creating a brighter future for the Jewish people, like Ariel and Michael and Naomi and the other folks that have um, poured their blood, sweat, and tears uh, into this work. I'm so excited to see everyone here for this conversation, as I know Ilya would be. So let's get started. Thank you. Um, I can introduce Stacy Turner, who's going to um, open this up for conversation and, and present the cash to group. Great. Thank you, Marina. I love that quote from Ilya. I'm going to use it. <laughs> um, for over a decade, the Jim Joseph Foundation has been committed to supporting research and the application of research that builds the field of Jewish education. We understand that any mature and professional field needs a base of knowledge from which to improve and move forward. At the time we were considering investing in this program of research, it had been more than 10 years since the last systematic effort to collect data about the Jewish educator workforce. In some areas of Jewish education, no large scale data had ever been collected on a national level we recognized there was a need to more deeply understand what factors would help professionalize the field and support Jewish educators to be successful. So we co-funded the CASG study with our partners at the William Davidson Foundation, 
as it was designed to provide usable knowledge about the recruitment, retention, and professional development of Jewish educators. Housed at George Washington University, CASG brings together scholars, practitioners, and funders to design and steward rigorous research projects to address pressing challenges in our field. By doing this, CASG offers us a critical service, bringing knowledge, skills, infrastructure, networks, standards, and transparency to the process of research and evidence-informed decision-making. In our field, funders are often positioned as policymakers, even though we may not always have formal training in policy-oriented research and analysis. CASG helps funders ensure that the research they sponsor is usable and the knowledge they produce is used well. Finally, I'm happy to introduce two people for whom I have immense respect. Dr. Michael Foyer is Dean of the Graduate School of Education and Human Development and Professor of Education Policy at the George Washington University. And among many accomplishments, he is the past president of the National Academy of Education. He is also past chair of the CASG Advisory Board. Dr. Aria Levitas is the managing director of CASG. Her research focuses on contemporary American Jewish education. She has funded a number of, I'm sorry, she's conducted a number of applied studies on behalf of American Jewish educational enterprises with a focus on young adults and teens. Her work has been recognized with awards from the Woodrow Wilson Foundation, the Society for Scientific Study of Religion, and the Network for Research in Jewish Education. And you can read more about both of their impressive achievements online. It was difficult to choose which ones to highlight for you. Uh, and I just want to conclude by thanking you for being here to learn from both of them today. Thanks so much, Stacey, for that introduction. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Arielle Levitas. I'm so happy to be here today to talk a little bit about the CASG career trajectories of Jewish educator study and its implications for your own work. Uh, I Please forgive me. I do have some PowerPoint slides that we're going to queue up now. I promise not to try and inundate you too, too much, um, but I it's such a rich study that we just did want to take this opportunity to share a little bit of the data, what your appetite may be, um, because we know that you're likely here because you share um, a commitment to or at least a curiosity about using research-based evidence to improve Jewish education. Certainly the general zeitgeist impels us to all want to be data-driven. That sounds like a very good thing. We all want to be investing in what works, which certainly sounds better than the alternative. But what does it mean to use research and data to make decisions and to evaluate plans for action? Next slide. So uh, Stacy did an amazing job of giving sort of the CASG elevator pitch, but we work to make positive change in Jewish educational settings by generating evidence-based actionable ideas for the field. Our job is to get the right data and help put it to good use uh, to improve what exists and imagine what can be. And today we're gonna talk a little bit about what it looks like to put research to good use using our now officially award-winning CASG uh, Career Trajectories Project um, as a case study. Um, at CASG, it's worth underscoring, we don't do any old research. We incubate and steward high quality applied research. And this strategy is grounded in um, a proposition that the most useful research is produced when it's explicitly designed to respond to the pressing and enduring questions of the people best positioned to use it, people like yourselves. Um, so applied research is not only about technical know-how, quasi-experimental designs, p-values, right? Producing uh, high quality applied research, right? Research findings that are poised to be reliable, meaningful, and useful is also very much about relationships, listening, knowing how to build bridges and share knowledge across multiple professional communities, including educational leaders, funders, and other policy influencers, and harnessing diverse expertise, both from within and outside of Jewish education. 
Uh, next slide. Uh, at CASG, we certainly appreciate that using research evidence is not always a simple or straightforward proposition. Uh, and a lot of things come to the table when we make decisions about Jewish education. Um, we want to make sure there's room for our highest values, our vision, our aspirations, our traditions, the wisdom of experience. But there are some uninvited guests that sometimes crowd around this table too, by which I mean old habits, unfounded assumptions, outdated schema. Um, so CASG's work is to persuade, persuade you and other leaders and policy influencers that research evidence ought to have a seat at this decision-making table as well. So I'm going to go ahead and jump in now to share some research findings as examples of how research can give insight into workforce and human capital challenges in Jewish education and help us frame some evidence-based plans for action that respond to these challenges. So again, our case study is the Career Trajectories of Jewish Educators Study, which was generously funded by the William Davidson Foundation and Jim Joseph Foundation. And this study was organized around four major research questions to understand the recruitment, retention, and development of Jewish educators. Like all larger scale CASG studies, this project launched with what we call a problem formulation convening, which is sort of fancy jargon for a developmental conversation that brings together diverse stakeholders in Jewish education to thoughtfully frame the key questions that we want to be positioned to answer and respond to at the end of the project. And you can find out more about the study process and what we learned um, in the nine reports and briefs that we published on our website that are available for free download. And I'm going to pop a link uh, into the chat right now for those of you who haven't had a chance yet um, to check out some of those publications. Um, and certainly you can also browse our other publications, infographics, and webinars here. Um, uh, and I'll just note that none of the work at CASG is proprietary or sits behind paywalls. We want to make sure that our study findings are accessible to anyone who seeks to learn with us. Okay, so why do these questions, the questions that framed our study, why do they even matter? Next slide, please. So if we care about the vitality of Jewish life in the United States today and in the future, we necessarily need to care about our Jewish educational programs and our Jewish education workforce. Jewish educators shape our experience of Judaism in the here and now. They shape what the Jewish community is going to look like in the future. And we are certainly not going to be positioned to have a tree that can develop beautiful flowers and nourishing fruits without educators who can cultivate and care for it. Um, next slide. But we have some like empirical reasons that educators matter also. So the quality of educators matters for learner outcomes. In general education research, teacher quality is the number one most important school-based determinant of student outcomes. So we know uh, that educators and educator quality makes a difference for learning. And with that in mind, we at CASG, with a tremendous list of supporters and partners, set out to learn about our Jewish education workforce. And when I say next slide, I'm going to kind of when hit you with a lot of names here. When I say tremendous list of partners, I mean, if you really want to see applied research at work, take a look at all of the people who contributed to this project. Uh, next slide. It was so many people that I wasn't able to acknowledge everyone by name in the time allotted to me at the JFN Award Program. Thank you to the researchers, to the Technical Advisory Committee, talk about an amazing brain trust, to the practitioner leaders. Um, we have so much talent who contributed their expertise and goodwill to this project. And next slide, thank you, of course, to the CASG Advisory Board as well. A lot of people to contribute to applied research. Next study. Uh, our study used a broad definition of Jewish educators. And I'm also going to put um, our working definition into the chat. Um, because I know oftentimes people have a lot of questions and I see there's a question in the chat about the slides. I'm happy to share the slides and I know that there's also gonna be a recording uh, of, the, of this program that will be made available as well. 
Um, and I'll just say that all of the data here is also pulled from the research briefs and reports that are published on our website if you want to kind of understand these slides in, in a bit of a larger context as well. So that's our definition of educators, uh, people working for pay, directly with learners, post-college age. Um, and it includes people who educate in day schools and camps and youth groups, um, environmental education, in person, online, all the expected and less expected places where we know that Jewish education takes place. And I will say that given the variability and in settings and in institutions, um, that we looked at, even as um, I'm going to speak a lot today in aggregate about Jewish educators or the labor market or Jewish education workforce. Um, one finding of the study was that we might be better served by conceptualizing this as a markets plural to understand educators in particular contexts. And briefly, I'll just say a word about the timeline also. Um, the study was conducted over about a year and a half, roughly between early 2020 and the summer of 2021. And I don't need to tell all of you that that was a pretty volatile time. So various data points that I'm sharing were collected a little bit pre-COVID, early COVID, like during lockdowns, and then um, hopefully late, late COVID, I guess. Um, all right, next slide. Um, so I'm going to just give a little summary. I'm going to tell you two stories that emerge from the data. Um, the first one will be about responding to a recruitment and retention crisis. And the second is about minding critical gaps in professional learning. But again, you can visit our website for reports, summaries, highlights, et cetera, uh, to learn about the full scope of what we studied and what we learned. Next slide. Jewish educational leaders have long forecast a pipeline problem, and it seems as though the crisis point may be arriving. Educational leaders are struggling right now to fill openings with qualified educators. Um, a tiny bit of context from data about the larger U.S. educational workforce. Next slide. Um, this shows uh, Americans seeking degrees in education. This is out. This is not Jewish education. This is general education from 1970 until today. Like the absolute number has dropped. The proportion of the population has dropped as well. And then if you look at the next slide, this tells us about changing ideas about the appeal of teaching as a career. Again, this is just broadly in the United States, parental attitudes about teaching as a profession. Do you want your child to be a teacher? Do you think that's a good job? Today, more parents say no than yes to that question. Um, and there are lots of reasons that have been identified um, in terms of explaining these shifts and trends. And maybe we'll talk a little bit about that in the Q&A in the context of Jewish education. Um, in Jewish education, next slide, um, our recruitment challenges differ by sector. Part-time supplemental schools, what we sometimes call Hebrew schools, often have the greatest struggle. Um, and again, this infographic is based on data we collected at the beginning of the pandemic, but it does still reflect degrees of difficulty that various sectors face. Um, and what I would say is that the climate has become more challenging across many sectors. So even, for example, camping, which historically has had among the easiest time, finding qualified candidates is now struggling with workforce challenges. Uh, next slide. Okay, so we look to understand in terms of recruiting people into the field, right? What distinguishes those who enter the field from other promising candidates who don't enter who, or who try it out and leave? Uh, and we learned that early career Jewish educators tend to be more mission driven when compared to their peers. So they report strong commitments to helping others, to Jewish learning, and to their own growth. Next slide. And when we look at what keeps promising candidates out of the field, like what are the inhibitors, right, from launching a career in Jewish education, promising candidates tell us um, about um, they have perceptions of poor work-life balance um, in Jewish education, that they're deterred by low job status, and also what we call the parochial context. That is the idea that working in Jewish education means working with a homogenous population in contexts that lack diversity, which is generally not appealing 
uh, to younger people in the US contemplating career opportunities. Next slide. We also learned that Jewish educators largely enter the field somewhat by accident. That's so they don't necessarily carefully plan for a career as Jewish educators. They have an opportunity and they decide to stay. And that means that many have bypassed pre-service programs that are um, developed to equip them with the skills, the knowledge, and the networks they need to succeed in the work. And this all plays a role later down the line in terms of the resilience that they may have to call upon when the work can get challenging. So that's a little bit about the recruitment context for Jewish educators. But we don't only have recruitment challenges, we also have retention challenges as well. Next slide. The pandemic has accelerated retirements um, and the stressors of being a frontline educator in a pandemic has driven some people from the field. We also have larger market forces at work, which mean that there are many available positions outside of Jewish education today that pay better salaries. Um, and we've seen this, um, this has been especially pronounced in early childhood education. Next slide. As far as retention goes, this gives you a sense of how long people stay uh, in the work by various institution types. Uh, so early childhood and day school teachers tend to stay in their institutions the longest. Uh, and we see a lot more churn in the fields that um, rely on younger educational staff. So that entirely makes sense. Um, those positions aren't designed for someone to stay in them uh, over the longer term usually. So we see a lot of movement in the field. Next slide. Um, and when we asked educators, this is before COVID, about their plans to stay in the field, we found a couple interesting things. So one, almost half of the people um, in the study plans to plan to stay in the field for the rest of their career. Okay, they're very dedicated. But even pre-COVID, a quarter of the educators in our survey were weighing their options. Okay, they were sort of thinking about what they might do. They weren't sure. So we asked those, next slide, who are planning on leaving, what were the main factors that influenced their choice to leave, right? This is an opportunity to think about kinds of interventions that might matter to Jewish educators. Um, and we heard about compensation and benefits, workplace environments, and access to professional development. These were themes that kept recurring in our study. We actually have um, research briefs that address each of them. But I'm just going to pick up on one thread here um, and go a little deeper with you over the next couple minutes. So our second story is about gaps in the professional learning that's available to Jewish educators. Next slide. Again, this is important because we know from research evidence in general education that high quality professional learning is associated with educator retention, educator quality, which ultimately all leads to improved learner outcomes. And again, I know this can sound kind of meta and maybe dissociated from the programmatic, uh, the programs we wanna invest in that show us you know, smiley, happy children's faces. But if we want those smiley, happy children's faces, um, we have to uh, think about how we're investing in the development of the educators who are supporting those environments. Um, so uh, next slide. We also know from research in general education that there are several facets of professional learning that empirically have been shown to lead to improved outcomes for students. Actually, the uh, the first author on this is Heather Hill. She's one of our newest CASG advisory board members. Um, so we've really benefited from the expertise of our advisory board in terms of thinking about uh, professional learning for Jewish educators today. Um, and some of those facets include um, designing uh, collaboratively uh, teacher development programs and ensuring that the programs are offering actual concrete skills and materials to support uh, teaching. So these are the kinds of professional development programs that have been associated with improved learner outcomes. They tend to be workplace embedded, ongoing, teacher-led. Um, there are a lot of facets to them, so let's hold this in mind. The next slide, perfect, shows how in-service educators assess their own access to PD. Okay, these are Jewish educators. Three quarters tell us they have access to professional learning, which is an actual decline 
since the last time that question was studied about 15 years ago, the Aegis study of Jewish educators. Um, uh, in our own sample from just before COVID, we found that overall, a little more than half of all educators surveyed said they had sufficient opportunities for professional development. Um, next slide. And even when we're looking at full time, so these are full time educators, just under half of full time educators are getting more than eight hours a year. Uh, next slide. And again, this matters because um, high quality teacher learning is associated with positive outcomes. Uh, in our own CASG data set, we found that they were weakly associated with um, improved educator outcomes. And it could be because we were not um, able to account for the quality of the professional learning in our model, which is certainly something for future study. Um, and that's important, right? Because it's we want to underscore that it's not just any old professional learning that leads to positive outcomes. It's professional learning with those particular characteristics and practices. Uh, next slide. And when we hear about the kind of learning that professional educators today tell us they have access to, they tell us about the one-shot workshop, okay? These are kind of like one-offs. It's a lecture from an outside expert often. Um, and unfortunately, um, these kinds of one-off content-oriented lectures are not associated with um, positive outcomes for educators or for learners. Uh, so I think just in the interest of time, we're going to skip ahead a couple slides, if that's okay. So um, one more. Yeah. So perfect. We're going to land here. So I just want to wrap up by briefly gesturing to some interventions that we might think about um, that, that might emerge from these findings. So one, um, we could use these findings to help conceptualize a comprehensive vision for how recruitment, retention, and development are not actually discrete phenomenon, but interrelated. Um, retention problems start earlier down the line, the study suggests. They reflect the available processes and programs for recruitment, induction, ongoing professional learning. Uh, and we need ideas that are grounded in a holistic vision for the career arc of Jewish educators. Uh, next slide. We can think about how we're investing in educator preparation so that educators have the knowledge and networks they need to thrive in these career in their careers. Um, at this time, philanthropy and Jewish education is not particularly bullish uh, on tuition uh, for our teacher preparation and learning. And our study actually shows that the market disincentivizes seeking a formal degree in Jewish education because a degree is a real cost to the student, both in tuition and an opportunity without necessarily much gain in the job market. And next slide, uh, career ladders. Many jobs in Jewish education feel like dead end jobs. Um, and we noticed something interesting in the larger study that is that there's an absence of what's sometimes called teacher leaders. Um, the work of direct instruction in Jewish education is very flat terrain with a little to no opportunity to advance unless you're going to go out of direct instruction and into administration. Um, so we have sort of this absence of a tier of leadership in a field that loves leadership and loves investing in leaders, um, whereby we're not necessarily um, making use of talented educators as uh, a resource um, to be used in our institutions, to build cultures of continuous improvements, to help frame the ongoing professional learning of their colleagues. Uh, so those are just a couple of ideas that emerge from uh, the study data. I'm going to go ahead and pass things over now to Michael Foyer, uh, Dean of the Graduate School uh, of Education at GW and famously a member of the CASG advisory board, and maybe we'll pick up some of the ideas later in uh, our Q&A. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, uh, Ariel. Thank you, everybody, for being part of this. Thank you to JFN for acknowledging the amazing work uh, that uh, that uh, CASG has been doing and for, and for giving us this uh, lovely award that uh, I know will 
uh, it means so much to the whole CASG community and to all of us. So thanks in advance for all of that. Um, look, I only have 10 minutes, so I'm going to break tradition and really try to uh, stick to my time here. Um, I wanted to, first of all, thank our funders uh, for taking the chance with us, because we know that funders, when they are thinking of working with organizations that thrive on research, um, need to a little bit uh, appreciate some delayed gratification and uh, uncertainty as to uh, how useful the results will be and when. And all I can say is that the funders who have been supporting both CASG uh, in general and its specific projects and others, some of whom are on my screen, who are funding other of our work, such as in Israel education and related things, we know that this is uh, part of a part of your your taking a chance. And in in a way, it's a metaphor for what I think educational research is really all about. It is to some extent experimenting with ideas, seeing how they work, and then being willing and able to make adjustments uh, accordingly. Um, I was asked about uh, examples of where education research more generally makes a difference. And um, interestingly, I, uh, I have two and a half examples to share with you for your consideration and with my encouragement that you look at these a little bit more closely in your in your own time. Um, Ariel and I did not uh, script this in advance, completely spontaneously and coincidentally. I also chose as my first example some work that Heather Hill has been involved with. Um, and uh, why not? I mean, um, this is exemplary of a of a strand in education research that blends uh, the virtues of rigor with the appreciation for relevance. Uh, Heather's work on, for example, preparing mathematics teachers is really something worth looking at more closely. Um, I'll just read one little snippet from uh, Heather's work on this. Results from our randomized field trial uh, document sizable and sustained effects on teachers' ability to analy analyze instruction and on their instructional practice. Uh, but, however, these improvements in instruction did not result in corresponding increases in math test scores, at least based on some standardized tests. And the reason that I include that however phrasing is because I think this is exemplary of something that we need more of in education research generally and as it relates to the world of Jewish education and that is some humility about all this that these results are at times uh, quite compelling and often require a certain amount of pause before one becomes irrationally exuberant about how the results will be guaranteed and, and what we learn from the research um, as it is presented. And Heather is, uh, you know, an exemplary, uh, is, is, a, is, a, is a terrific example of what I wish more education research could be about. Another example I wanted to share with you comes from work at the Rand Corporation. This is primarily uh, led by someone who is no longer at Rand, uh, but who's a, a very dear colleague uh, who's now working at AIR, with whom we've had <laughs> various relationships over the years. But Laura Hamilton, who is a very distinguished educational measurement and educational policy expert, had been working with Rand on a project that they referred to as their Truth Decay <laughs> Initiative. Um, I love, you know, catchy titles for even rather complicated research and truth decay in our current zeitgeist. I can't really think of a better metaphor for what we should be aspiring to 
which is presenting uh, facts and data and evidence as authentically as possible, even against uh, the will or against the 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 trends or the or the the currents that are uh, working against that. In this case, what among the things in the Truth Decay Initiative, uh, there's a report that discusses uh, the um, efforts to improve media literacy among young people. And you can see how that relates to the truth decay kind of metaphor. Uh, and again, it represents a framework for implementing uh, and then evaluating efforts to improve media literacy among young people. So I, I, would, I would commend that one to you also uh, to look at a little bit more. And the third, and I'll be very brief about this, you've probably been reading about uh, a, a recent uh, new eruption of what we in the education business have known for a long time as the quote unquote reading wars. And this is, uh, this was, it was just an article in yesterday's New York Times, which I'm afraid only told part of the story, part of partly well. Uh, it's a very complicated story. It has to do with um, whether we have been going overboard in our attempt to develop and use various approaches to teaching reading and what the effects have been on young people's reading capacities, especially in the United States. Um, the reason that I, I mention that one is because some of the media frenzy about the condition of reading in America uh, could use a little bit of, uh, shall we say, refinement by people who care about truth decay. <laughs> and some of what you're reading about the sorry state of reading among American youth uh, is a bit exaggerated. Uh, there, is some, there is some truth and there is some concern, definitely. But it points to a need to have a reliable kind of source of data to use, uh, you know, to sort of calibrate some of these rather more sharply worded polemics about the condition in this case of reading. But I can tell you that the same thing is happening again in mathematics and in science education and in the humanities. And it's an, a good example of where uh, once again, we need to think about um, the science of education being framed as something to promote deliberation and 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 discussion, rather than to foster yet another uh, uh, another round of polarization. So the next thing I'm going to spend two minutes talking about is um, something that uh, Ariel asked me to mention and to talk about a little bit. And that is um, sort of where does philanthropy fit into some of some of these issues and some of these uh, trends in education research? So just as a as a baseline, um, you know, I, I wrote a book in 2016, which had a catchy phrase in it, something along the lines of Americans flirt with stupidity, but they buy knowledge. And I, I liked it. It was pithy and fun except that the book came out a week after the 2016 presidential election. So people wondered if I had sort of turned off my TV when I wrote that line. In any event, um, the point was that we do spend a great deal of money in the United States on the evaluation of educational progress and on educational um, uh, research and evaluation spending by 11 of the most prominent organizations just in 2016 hovered around $2 billion. We now have in the United States 2,397 think tanks, many of which actually have units or programs or divisions that specialize in education. For more information about the world of think tanks, I would encourage you to look at the University of Pennsylvania's Lauder Institute and the website and the reports that they are doing. It's fascinating to think about the world of think tanks, both in the US and internationally. Um, the reason I'm mentioning that is because where does philanthropy fit into this very complex ecology 
of education research, advice giving, and the connections between the research community and policymakers. And I think there also, the philanthropic community, which has been, I think, one of the jewels of the American democratic experiment, needs to continue to um, recognize its very special role in promoting and, and guaranteeing a flow of as much independent information as possible, especially when we are in such polarized times. And I'm not sure about this, but I've, I've just been thinking and rereading some of the Lauder reports about the think tanks, thinking about the great work of CASG, thinking about the other work that you and your foundations and philanthropies are interested in and supporting. And it occurs to me that the Jewish community in the United States uh, might actually benefit from something like, and I, this may not sound you know, kosher, uh, but something like a Jewish Brookings. In other words, a think tank that is actually devoted to the development and diffusion, not so much the support of research itself, which is of course something that CASG does so beautifully, but rather as a clearinghouse for what does some of this research-based evidence actually mean for Jewish, uh, Jewish education, for Jewish civilization more generally? Uh, I don't know. I think um, anything that the philanthropic community can do to promote more deliberation, and by the way, this meeting is a good example of how support for CASG promotes conversation among people who need to be thinking about these things. But to blow that up into something even bigger uh, would be something I think worth considering, along with possibly, uh, because we have this thing called the National Assessment of Educational Progress, which is such an important um, instrument against which one can calibrate and take catch one's breath when there are so many polemics and partisan statements flying around, to have a reliable source of data, I was suddenly thinking to myself, gosh, wouldn't it be cool to have something like a national assessment of Jewish educational progress, <clears throat> which could be designed with a sort of similar spirit of getting information not necessarily holding schools or educators accountable, but providing a general picture of how we're doing. All of those things and many more are the kinds of things where in particular in the Jewish community, the philanthropic, the philanthropic sector uh, is the place to start thinking about these kinds of ideas. So I think uh, hats off to all of you for your commitment to this and thanks for your encouragement and support. Uh, there's a ton of good work waiting to happen. And, uh, you know, on behalf of um, my colleagues in G G Shed and GW, all I can say is uh, Kadima, we're going ahead together with a lot of this. So thanks so much. Great, thank you. Um, we're now gonna welcome Carrie Alterman from the William Davidson Foundation to um, speak more about the study and their involvement with it. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Michael. That was really interesting. Ariel, wow, you reminded me about my favorite quote from Doug Stewart and the Fisher Foundation of no stories without data and no data without stories. I've learned so much already today from a subject we at the William Davidson Foundation are already passionate about. Uh, when we embarked on this partnership with Jim Joseph a few years ago, it was in response to assumptions and trends we were seeing both in our home community of Detroit and also around the Jewish world of quality teachers retiring, fewer educators available to take their place. We we're thinking of the foundation's unique history of investment in Jewish educational leadership, including of course, the William Davidson Graduate School of Jewish Education at JTS, the Wexner Fellowship and Davidson Scholars, and a long time funding of local Jewish educational programs here in Detroit, dating to Mr. Davidson's life and since. Um, we're always looking to be in a position that's better informed for how to make the most impactful investments. And our, when our friends at Jim Joseph asked if we'd consider joining them in this endeavor, we knew then, and we're still sure that it was a sound investment, as you can all be sure. 
um, that we knew it could assist us in ways large and small as we worked to respond to the community's needs. I actually looked back at our notes from talking with our board about the opportunity, and it was noted, and I quote, staff, along with many important leaders in the field of Jewish education, have assessed the opportunity for impact that this particular research program um, can offer within the field of Jewish education as potentially groundbreaking, and this research has the capacity to set the stage for numerous transformational interventions by funders and practitioners. I humbly know that this is completely true. This is where this research has led us. So what are we going to do about it? Uh, in Detroit, right after this research came to light and in the middle of the pandemic, we looked for an easy way to thank the frontline educators to try and have some retention. And we wanted to thank the school professionals too, those who keep the schools functioning for their work, um, especially during the pandemic under incredibly challenging circumstances. So for us, we partnered with Federation here in Detroit holding extravagant breakfast for the staff at every single school as they were getting ready to go back to school in the school year. And I think it was August, 2021. And we offered them all a really generous gift card along with this really lovely breakfast and a thank you opportunity. With the only stipulation, we told them the gift card was theirs, but they had to buy themselves something and it couldn't be used for their classrooms. It was a small gesture, but one that we hope that they appreciated because we wanted to act quickly on this research and know what was happening here in our hometown. Also here, we're working currently with the JCC and Federation to really think about community assets and needs in a holistic way, using this research as a model and as a guide. We're thinking really hard about the talent pipeline of Jewish educators and what we can do to recruit, train, and retain more teachers and educators. We're thinking of what professional development interventions might work. So we don't do this alone. A huge thank you to our partners here in Detroit and around the country. We hope to further and enable the work, but truth be told, we don't do the work. So thank you to those who really do. Uh, and the biggest thank you, of course, to Arielle, who's a Davidson Scholar. We're always proud of that. We always point that out uh, and her team. To Stacy and all of our colleagues at Jim Joseph, and of course, to our former program officer, Manny Menchel, who together worked so hard to ensure that this work would be meaningful. So I'm going to turn it back over to Ariel for Q&A, and it's really nice to be here with all of you today. Thanks so much, Carrie. Thanks to all our speakers. And I believe we're open now for Q&A and your questions, um, which you can go ahead and put in the chat. Uh, can be directed, I believe, at any to any of our panelists who've spoken today. So Stacy and Marina, Carrie, Michael, or myself. Um, we'd love to hear what, what you're thinking, what questions you have. Quiet. I'll give I'll give you a minute to collect your thoughts, and then if not, we'll we'll jump in uh, for some discussion amongst ourselves. Okay. Um. So, I have a few questions. Wait, for... I just have a question, maybe from Rachel Abrahams. Oh, do we see a question there? Oh, uh, Rachel, did you have a question? I just actually, I wanted to make a comment. I wanted to thank the funders and Kashi. I just, the Mayberg Foundation has used the data so much since it's come out. Um, we've worked, we've launched a program to promote high quality professional development called DEEP. Uh, where we're, our, one of our programs, JIC, the Jewish Education Innovation Challenge, is working with Prisma, who launched uh, a pipeline recruitment and retention think tank that we hope to have information to share with the field in, you know, in the winter time. Um, and, and we've constantly gone back to the report time after time after time. Um, so just all of you should know it's really been used in the field. Um, and, and, uh, and thank you. Thanks so much, Rachel. And there's a question from Marina here um, about um, when educators leave, what kinds of opportunities are they leaving for? So we actually didn't um, collect kind of like systematic data on where people who have left the field are, are going. 
And But what we do know about Jewish educators, right, and I think I said a little bit about this in the beginning, is that it's a that's a pretty diverse group of people. We have people who are credentialed, for example, in, uh, in education. Maybe they have a master's degree in teaching and learning or something. Um, and, and people with credentials tend to be um, in, for example, teaching in day schools. And then we have... Um, uh, sectors where you're less likely to find that the educator has like a professional degree in education. Um, and so they may be going into any kind of work. And sometimes people sort of see it as a, and a lot of the jobs actually, we've seen that in youth groups and camping and campus engagement, for example, are, are actually designed to be like quick churn, um, early career uh, opportunities with the idea that people are going to move on to something else. Um, and sort of like what that something else might be um, can be pretty diverse. The people who are kind of testing a career in Jewish education tend to be people who are interested in nonprofit work, helping others, for example, but there are ways in which what they think about um, the professional conditions of, of Jewish education look like, the workplace conditions, work-life balance, compensation, et cetera, um, kind of deter them from going forward. Some of that is based on experiences that they have, and some of it is based on ideas that might not actually match what the field looks like. Um, and one uh, deterrent that we found is actually people don't have a good idea about what kind of careers are available to them in Jewish education, early career um, educators. So they think, for example, that if they want to um, make an impact in Jewish education or have a job in the Jewish world that they have to be a rabbi. They don't necessarily see other opportunities for growth and development and advancement in Jewish education via other avenues, in part because we probably haven't done a particularly good job of delineating what some of those avenues might look like as well. Any other questions? You can drop it in the chat or feel free to um, just jump in. Okay, well, I have a question actually for maybe Stacy or Carrie, if they don't mind being put on the spot, but I'm wondering what, what you, you know, you've been part of this study from its sort of conceptualization all the way now to this um, really lovely occasion to celebrate the work. And I'm wondering what surprised you most along the way, either um, something that emerged from the data or what it meant to be involved in the work of producing uh, education research, applied research. I'd love to hear if you wouldn't mind a few words about that. Stacey, it's, um, I'll, I'll go first really quickly. And I have uh, my colleagues, Darren McKeever, our president and CEO, and Shauna Cantor, our program officer for Jewish life on the call as well. And I'm sure they can jump in. Um, I was actually, the thing that's been most amazing to me about the research is I, somebody said it earlier, it's the gift that keeps on giving. This was not a small amount. It wasn't like a, a one-off. The depth of all the research has continued to show us different threads of how we as a, especially as a funding community, can have different areas of focus and continue to make a difference and move towards solving the problem. It is a huge issue and there's so many different ways of looking at the data. So I'm constantly surprised. I appreciate Rachel, you saying how you guys keep going back to it and saying like, oh, now we can do this piece. That's kind of, that's what's so surprising in a, in a positive surprise. The negative surprises, of course, some of these things were things that we um, we just kind of knew. We all thought that that some of these things were happening, and then we had the data behind us to prove that we were unfortunately correct. And um, and some of these issues are really their uh, community, their huge community challenges. So those were both good and more challenging, if you will. Daisy, I don't know if you had anything to add as well. Thanks, Gary. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, just personally, the thing that was most surprising to me was um, the point that you were making, Ariel, about the marketplace and that and what what people are recruiting for, um, not necessarily um, roles that have degrees attached um, 
and how the, you know, just the implications of that on how resilient educators are when they get into the field and, and um, start encountering challenges. Like that is something to think about and that's big. And um, I think that was probably the most su surprising thing to me that that was playing out. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll, that answers your question, I think. <laughs> I, I will just say, like, we have continued to use this research also. Um, it has sort of infiltrated how we think about um, uh, providing professional development and and um, how how we think about one of our strategic priorities, which is except, you know, building exceptional Jewish leaders and educators and just how our team, you know, from from our CEO on down, has, it has just come, it has just become part of how we, how we talk about what we know and what we don't know. Um, and really, um, it, the research has a seat at, at our table of decision making, along with all of these other um, things that we learn from the field, um, anecdotally and from other research. Um, so I, I think that's been uh, a culture change for us, for sure. Thanks, Stacey. I see we have two raised hands, one um, from Shelley Marsh and uh, one from Joanne Greenaway. And so maybe if each of you would ask your questions and then we'll try and sort of take them together if possible. Shelley, do you want to go ahead first? Sure. Thank you. Mine is um, more of a of a comment, which is um, uh, and Joanne may say something very similar coming from um, the same side of the pond as I'm in here in the UK. Um, for me, Again, your your presentation was so spot on for me. Um, I've I've worked with young leaders, um, most of whom have, have been involved in Jewish youth movements, summer camps, that that area of work, uh, and everything that you said just resonated so deeply with exactly what um, some of the challenges that, that we've identified um, in the UK. And I perceive also in Europe. So I'm looking forward to diving into your research and uh, and learning from it and can only just share huge appreciation. The fact that I was able to join this call um, and, and have really learned so much that it isn't just on this small island. Every now and again, we think, oh, well, we're a fairly small community. Um, and these are the issues that we need to to really address. But actually, these are global Jewish issues um, that, that we're facing in, in communities across the world. So really fascinating. Jo, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you, Shelley. Um, I'm glad that we speak um, with a similar voice, but I really also wanted to endorse. I, I run an organisation, London School of Jewish Studies, that is all about excellence in teachers and um, I'd like Shelley, who's more on the informal side, we're on the formal teacher training side, and we have very much used the research. Um, and I just wanted you to be aware that the investment that you've made in this research project um, spreads further afield than, you know, than your own shores, because it's fed into a big cross-communal project that we've led here, um, looking into research and retention, um, you know, recruitment and retention, which is a, which is a huge problem also um, for us but here we don't have the funding to conduct the same scale of research projects that you do um, so we've been able to feed off that investment and kind of take it forward here where we have many of the same issues but you know some some um, local variants as well so yeah just sharing my thank you thank you so much for sharing that we're at the end of our time but i just want to say it's so gratifying and exciting to hear about how people are using the research in places we knew about and maybe further afield than we were aware. I just want to drop my email into the chat if anyone wants to follow up, if you have questions about the presentation, about CASG, if you want to share with us how you're using the research or how you're thinking about what comes next, we would love to hear from you. Um, what a great example of the value of applied research, which is to make all of us smarter and to put knowledge, um, infiltrate lots of conversations. Um, and we really hope that um, the research can really, you know, spark some thoughtful deliberation amongst you and your colleagues and stakeholders in improving Jewish education. Thank you all so much for your time today.
thank you, thank all you for to joining. our panelists too. Yes, thank you so much, everyone. Have a great day. I hope you enjoyed the program. Thank you.